All right, y'all turn to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Our Father, we thank You for Your grace and Your mercy and the peace and the love that You bestow upon us. Lord, we know all good things come to us because of Your grace. We know if we have the promise that we're in Your grace, we must have peace. And Lord, we ask You to bring that on us to give us complete peace of mind concerning the things of this world and concerning the things of sin and all the things that drag us down, all the doubts and fears that this world instills in us. Lord, we ask you to please let us see clearly through your scripture that you are the victor, that Christ has accomplished all things, and that your spirit is greater in us than he that dwells in the world. Lord, please guide us and direct us in this study today. Build us up and strengthen us in order that we might glorify our Savior. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up a, a, today in 2 Corinthians 11, and what I want to talk about is is a marriage. And I say that because most of y'all know me and Lexi just went up to a, a wedding in Kentucky. Some uh, good friends got married, and it's, I don't know, it's about the nicest wedding I've ever been to because you've got two people that are not only, you have no doubts what they believe, but you have no doubts that both of them are absolutely uh, focused on serving the Lord and they asked me to come up and preach at the wedding and I did and and I prepared some things but sometimes whenever you, you get to stand before a group of people you don't know you kind of um, I don't know you kind of read their faces as you're preaching and you kind of see what what's you got to kind of, you can't be too married to an idea let me put it that way so you've got to kind of adjust a little bit and and so I did adjust my message a little bit and preach more on the conviction of sin and I know it was the right thing to do because of the reaction so um, what I want to do today is I want to preach this not only for Nathan and for Talon but for us today because literally I said at the wedding that this book is a book about a marriage and it really is this book is a book a book that tells us how the father chose a bride for his son before the foundation of the world and how the bride fell into ill repute, or fell into, uh, into bondage, and the father allowed <clears throat> He then sent his son to recover her from that bondage in order that she might be joined unto him in love forever. So really, it is a book about marriage, and in all reality, it's a book about two marriages. There's the first marriage of Adam and Eve, and the fruit that it produced. Now, what fruit did the marriage between Adam and Eve produce? Sin. sin. Folks, they bore no fruit before sin that we read about in the Scripture. And so that union was ordained of God, wasn't it? And what's the best that Adam can do? Sin. He fails. Sin. Fig leaves. You got it. Adam's best brought in failure, didn't it? And that's because Adam had a will that was not God's will. Now, we've all got to agree that Adam had his own will. This is what separates humans from animals. Look, animals have a will, but the will is only so much as to survive, basically. But a human being can worship God and follow God's will and know God, but that same human being can also rebel against God, can he? Now, how do we know that Adam was not perfect as Christ is perfect? He sinned. Yeah, he sinned. Folks, could Jesus Christ have done that? No. no. So then we have gained through Christ a righteousness which Adam never had. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. And so what the firstborn could not do, the secondborn has done. And it is a story of two weddings. That's what this book is about. Now I want to start here in 2 Corinthians 11 and read what Paul says. Now, to give a little background, who was the first person that ever went to Corinth preaching the gospel? Paul. Paul. Who, what, what, when he writes the letters to the Corinthians, they had believed. We have the account of it in Acts. He spent several years there. But by the time he writes 1 Corinthians, and really 2 Corinthians a lot, but what happens is some people had come behind Paul. And what were they saying about Paul? That he was He's not really an apostle. You've got to beware of this guy now. And so Paul writes this letter and he tells them, look, I'm worried about you. And watch how he puts it in 11.1. 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, he says, and indeed bear with me. In other words, Paul had been pushed to boast of some things, hadn't he? See, these other men were boasting of their works. And Paul said, look, I hate to do this. This is foolish. But if this, these men that are teaching you these other doctrines want to boast in their accomplishments, okay, I'll talk about my accomplishments. And he goes on to say, look, I preach the gospel all over Europe. 
And he comes back to the main point, which is furthermore, I preach the gospel to you. Who did these Corinthians owe their salvation to? Who was the tool God used to save them? Paul. Paul. So he says, bear with me. Now verse 2. For, or because, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. In other words, he's not just jealous for his reputation or for the numbers. He's jealous after a godly sort of jealousy. What's creating this jealousy in Paul? Godliness. And he says, For or because I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, espoused is like we would say engaged. It's a little different, but it's the same. He says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now do y'all see how instantly we've got a comparison here, don't we? Two marriages. And the two marriages lay out in Scripture just like the Scriptures themselves. Now, how did all of this start the story of man over here? With a marriage, didn't it? With a union. And we've got the union over here of Adam and Eve. Okay? Now who ordained that union? God did. And what did God tell them to do? Bring forth fruit. Okay. What's the fruit that they brought forth? Sin. 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 Folks, they brought forth sin and henceforth sinners, didn't they? So, did God gain any fruit by that union? But did God have another union in mind? He did. Now, when does this next union take place? At the cross. At the cross, it's, it's, it's not consummate. At the cross, it's... um. It's, it's laid out. It's the proposal, isn't it? But when is this marriage consummated? When Christ, when Christ comes. So we start our Bible with a marriage, don't we? And we end it with a marriage over here. But what is an espousal? And it's a period between the, the proposal and the, the consummation. Okay. We've got here, I want you all to think about it this way. Did Adam and Eve have a period of probation? God put them in the garden. He yeah. told them to be fruitful and multiply. Eat of all the trees. And what did He do? He gave them a covenant. He said, I'll bless you. And He said, you'll, you'll rule over the earth. Don't eat from that one tree. He gave them a law, didn't He? He put them under a covenant of works. And as long as they did the work that God required, what happened? They were the children of God. Sure. But, what was the other side? The cursing. Blessed are you if you do my will, curse are you if you don't, right? Now, how does every man by, you, by this union back here come into the world? It produces sinners. What is a sinner's natural thought regarding pleasing God? Works. You've got to do it. Don't we all, we come into this world thinking if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell, right? Didn't God put Adam under that covenant? Yeah. He said, don't do it. If you do it, what happens? You die, right? Okay, so now let's talk about this word espoused. The word espoused, look, the Greek word's harmazo, and I know it doesn't matter what the Greek word is, but what it means is joined together. Okay, they're joined together. Now, uh, lots of times to, to establish the meaning of a word, we look at how it's used, right? Well, if we look at how this word was used in the times, we'll, we'll see what it means. Everybody's heard of Homer, right? The old Greek poet and wrote all those things. Homer used this same word for a carpenter joining planks together to build a house. Now, what's the idea there? Individual boards, but what do you do? You join them together and they become one house. We've also got the same idea used by Homer for notes. A man puts notes together, and what do they do? Song. They make songs. They make music. It's also used for uh, setting bones right. You know, you take two bones that have been broken, and you put them back together, and what happens to them? They become one. They become one stronger than it was before, don't they? All right, so this is what the word means. Now, it's used of clothes. It's used of threads that have been brought together. In other words, it's taking individuals and making them one. Now, that's the idea behind this word. But the most common use for it in all, all the Greek literature is about a father espousing. What was it? That kid's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> down there. 
No, no I just stepped on them There's another one behind you. It's great when you step on them at 2 in the morning. <laughs> okay, so the, the most common use is for a father to espouse a daughter by a marriage contract. Now, in the old days, how did the, how did the bride get picked? The father picked it. We always say the parents picked it, but that's not exactly true. The father picked the bride, right? So the father picked the bride for the wife. He, you know, in this wedding, there was something that, that takes place. It's very symbolic, and I really wanted to make, make an issue of it, but I, I, I really didn't. I, <clears throat> Talon's father brought her down the aisle. We all know the custom. Walk the aisle. And they're joined arm in arm, aren't they? And as they walk down the aisle... Tim was married him, and he said, okay, who gives this, this woman? Well, who gives her? The father. the father. You know what he had to then do? Break that union, didn't he? Now, all her life, who has been Talon's head? The father. The father. Who did she answer to? Whose house did she live in? Who supplied everything? Her father. At the night before at the, at the rehearsal, he said something that was hilarious, but it makes a good point. He said... Uh, Tim asked, said, do you have any final words to say to her? And he said, yeah, give me back my credit card. <laughs> that was funny, wasn't it? But y'all know something? There's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. What did he mean? You're no longer, You're no longer my responsibility. Not on the payroll. You're off the payroll. There you go. Now, breaking that union, in order for that second union to be lawful, you know, I, I love to see so much of this in these old movies. I always use the quiet man as an example. But why would Maureen O'Hara not marry John Wayne? Her brother wouldn't consent. Her father was dead. Her brother was her head. Without his consent, could she? She said, I can't possibly. And without her dowry, she couldn't. But the, the point being is, unless that first union is broken, now he breaks the union, he breaks loose his arm, and he gives her hand in marriage. Where does he put her hand? In the man's hand. Do y'all see the breaking of one union and the putting in of another? What did God do back here? I'll put Father. Okay. The Father chose a bride for His Son, and He sent His servant, the Holy Spirit, to acquire this bride, didn't he? So who's the other person in this picture? And the bride. Did he know the bride before the foundation of the world? Does the bride, the elect, fall into bondage? Now are all the people the bride? No, those he knew before the foundation of the world. But they fall into bondage. So in order for it to be a legal union, what's the father got to do? This is the one he's picked for his wife. She sold herself in the bondage, or literally her father sold her in the bondage, didn't he? We've got this throughout the Bible in the Hebrew law. Couldn't a man sell his daughter as a slave under the Hebrew yeah. law? Well, how long could she be a slave? No? Seven years. She, well, she could serve seven years under certain situations, but there were others. Until somebody bought her. Until the year of what? Jubilee. Uh -huh. What happened in the year of Jubilee? She went free. She was set free. Now, what does the year of Jubilee picture? It's Christ, folks. It's salvation in Christ. It's the setting free of the slaves. So then we've got the bride who's in bondage. That first union has got to be broken, doesn't it? What is that first union? What do we call it in the Scripture? Paul said, in Adam, all die, don't they? Well, what's the opposite? Christ. 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 All, live. All live. Is there not two unions there? Yeah. How do you enter into that first marriage? Born in Natural birth. 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 Folks, Adam picked you. Adam, your father, all of our father, chose for us, didn't he? And yet, how do you get in Christ? The Father chooses us. Okay, so that's this word, a spouse. Now, again, it's about a father coming into a marriage contract uh, for his son, and he picks the bride, doesn't he? Now, there's a great picture of this. If y'all would go over to Hosea 2, right after Daniel. Go where? Hosea, Hosea 2. Okay. Well, folks, the story of Hosea in many ways is this story, isn't it? God tells a man to marry an unfaithful woman. The man marries the unfaithful woman. He said, 
she's going to be unfaithful to you. And was she? She brought forth fruit unto other men, didn't she? And what did Hosea have to do for a while? He had to put her out of his house. But what happened later after she had learned her lesson the hard way? He went to get her. He went to get her. Literally, she winds up on a slave block and ain't nobody going to bid for her. She's a woman that's, that's been used up of the world and nobody wants her and all of a sudden, who bids on her? Her first husband. Now, that's kind of the picture that we have here. We've got God's bride fallen into ill repute and the Son coming, God the Son, to redeem her. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, in Hosea, we read this. verse uh, Chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Y'all know we, we say woo her, you know. You're going to uh, court her. He says, I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, she's come out of bondage and something has happened and he's going to renew her. He said, It shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt no more call me Baali. Now what that's referring to is you're going to call me my husband instead of my Lord. Now what's the difference between my husband and my Lord? One's a master that you better serve or else. The other is an intimate relationship, isn't it? So he says, oh, by the way, what do we call, how do we look at God as long as we think we've got to do certain works to be saved? Do you look at Him as a loving Father? He sits as your judge, doesn't He? And we always know that we, we've, we've uh, how would we say, we've made Him, uh, we've not satisfied His demands. He's, he's uh, unhappy with us because of our works, right? But what happens when you realize that, wait a minute, I'm a child of God by faith in Christ, not by my works. We begin to look at God differently, don't we? So He says, verse uh, 17, For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth. In other words, I'm going to cleanse her of idolatry and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Can y'all imagine a lady gets, uh, is, is a man comes along and wants to marry a woman, and I once heard Martin Lloyd-Jones, great old preacher, say that his wife married him. He was her 27th proposal. She was supposed to be just this beautiful woman in England. I don't mean she was running around with a bunch of men. She was just highly desirable. Lots of them wanted her for reasons, father's money, whatever that is. But, you know, he proposed to her years earlier. She told him no. Years later, he proposed, and she said, yeah. What about all those in between? Did she think about them every day anymore? Did she ever say, oh, if only I'd married so-and-so? Mm -hmm. Hey, y'all remember watching, uh, anybody like Carol Burnett? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Remember when they would originally do Mama's Family on Carol Burnett? <laughs> and the old lady would talk about the, the dad, the, Harvey Corman played Ed. Remember her husband? And Eunice would constantly talk about, I should have married so-and-so. And there's Ed sitting right there. Y'all remember? And, all, and her mom would say, you could have married this one or that one. You know what that kind of attitude. Well, is that the way that the church is going to think? Well, if I could just go back to Babylon, if I could just have the things of this world, if I would have met? No. So he says, why? He says, verse 18. In that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, with the creeping things of the ground. I will break the bow and the sword and the battle of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Now don't take prophetic language and make it literal and say this is when the, the animals are going to be changed and all. No. If you've got a covenant with the beasts of the field, you're going to be scared? You're going to worry about traveling? No. If you've got a, a covenant of peace and safety, you're going to worry about war and all these things? What happens to a person when they get saved? They don't we begin to have peace, don't we? So he says, I will betroth thee. Now there's our same word. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Please notice who did the betrothing. God. Y'all know how the gospel is preached today so often? As it's an invitation for you to please give a decision. Come on, come forward and get this done. It's up to you. You've got to do it. God's begging you. Is that how the Bible presents God's call? No. Not at all, is it? So he says, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Now can you say that Adam was betrothed to Eve in righteousness? God was righteous. Everything about that union was righteous, wasn't it? Then where did the unrighteousness come from? It came from Adam, didn't it? It came from Adam and Eve's dis or their rebellion. 
He says, verse 20, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. Now, if you betroth a wife unto you in faithfulness, what is she not going to do? She's going to cheat on you. So you and I get saved, and what happens? Here comes all our old girlfriends, all our old boyfriends. I don't mean physically. All those things that we've set our affection on from our youth. The things of this world, Satan comes roaring forward with them, doesn't he? And what happens to us so often? Many times we fall away and we're not faithful. That's the testing of the bride. But he says, I will betroth the enemy in faithfulness. Now what does that tell you? If you are betrothed unto Christ, are you going to fall away? You might fall for a time, but what does God do? He picks you up. Didn't Hosea's wife turn from him? Did Hosea's wife do anything to deserve to be back in Hosea's house? Then how did she get into Hosea's house? Hosea's grace. It was the grace and mercy of Hosea, wasn't it? Can we not say that of ourselves? Now next verse he says, It shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. In other words, I'm going to testify. This is going to be done like an I do. Everyone's going to hear. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel. In other words, the blessings are going to come. The gifts of the earth. I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people and they shall say, Thou art my God. Now so often this is presented to us as only representing Israel. Right? Israel fell away and God calls Israel back. Now people say, well, he started to call them here, but they wouldn't answer. So he's going to call them a second time over here. And over here, somehow, the second time, they're going to respond through Moses' law to the call. Anybody believe that? So now, who does this really represent? Is it talking about Israel in the flesh? In Romans 9, Paul said, no, it's talking about Israel not after the flesh, Israel in the spirit. Now let's go look at a couple quotes. Go to 1 Peter. Chapter 2. Next, is that something I needed? Mm -hmm. Have y'all ever uh, known a situation? I, I have uh, something very close to me that married a man, and in all reality, uh, it's my opinion that she married this man to get out of her father's house. Y'all all heard of situations like that? Sure. Things are so bad in the father's house that somebody comes along and, and she marries them for that. And later on you find out she, she probably wishes she'd have never even met this person because it, it, it affects her entire life, doesn't it? Well, in this particular case, can you say that anyone that has been betrothed and taken out of Adam would ever look back and say, oh, what did I do? But are there people that say I do that God never called? Lots of people run forward and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll enter in and God didn't call. Now watch what Peter says of these people. He says to these people in verse 2, 1 Peter 2, uh, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now how did these people he's talking to get to be newborn babes? They were born again. What did Paul call the Corinthians? Newborn babes. So they've been born of the Spirit. Because they've been born of the Spirit, he says in verse 9, ye are a chosen generation. Now what's the word chosen referred to? Who chose? God. He said a royal priesthood. How could you have a royal priesthood under Moses' law? You couldn't. Folks, under Moses' law, the Levites could be priests, the family of Aaron, but only Judah could be king. But under this covenant, it's a royal priesthood and holy, set-apart nation, a set-apart group of people, a peculiar people. Now, what does it mean, peculiar? Peculiar from who? The rest of the world. So you've got these people that are all in Adam. Okay? And that runs to the end of time, doesn't it? Now, what makes a person peculiar? When they're taken out of Adam and put into Christ, right? They're now a peculiar people. Watch what he says in verse 10 which in time past were not a people. Now, what he's talking about is, were they a group of people like they are in verse 9? In time past, there was no such people like this, was there? Because the Old Covenant didn't make uh, uh, any uh, accommodations for making such a people as this, but the New Covenant does. 
He said, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now there are those that would say Peter's only referring to the Jews there. Well, that's fine if you want to say he's referring to believing Jews, but go to Romans 9. Romans 9 is the chapter that will give someone fits if they don't believe God is sovereign. If you don't believe that God chooses and does as He wills, Romans 9 is a real problem for you. But He comes on down there and He says in verse uh, 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? If the potter owns the clay, can he do what he wants with it? Yeah. From time to time, I'll make something just to... Uh, just make something to hang a tool on, right? And I might make it out of a piece of walnut. And Lexi will say, why did you use walnut for that? What would you do this for? Don't do that. <laughs> See, the point being is it's, it's a good piece of wood. Walnut is beautiful, isn't yeah. it? But you know, to me, I use it because it's a little old scrap that otherwise I'm going to... Lexi has a hard time throwing away a piece of wood, I'll tell you all that. <laughs> Every hoarder. piece of wood is going to order. Huh? She's a hoarder. Yeah, she is somewhat of a hoarder. But see, I've got the opposite problem. I'm somewhat of an unclutter. I, the clutter, so I just, I'll start throwing it out. And a month later, say, hey, where's so-and-so? And she'll say, you threw it away. <laughs> but what I want y'all to see is, doesn't the clay belong to the potter? Yeah. Can he make whatever he wants with it? Yes. Can the clay accuse him of doing something wrong? Yeah. Well, who's the clay in this analogy? We are. We are, folks. We're made of the dirt. So he says, verse 22, what if God willing to show His wrath? Is wrath one of God's qualities? Yes. Does God hate sin? Yes. If God's going to make Himself known unto the world, does He not have to reveal His wrath as well as His... Yeah, cool. So to fully know God, we've got to not only know His love, but we've got to know His hatred of sin. Then what did that require? Sin. Did God allow all of this to happen? Yes. He did. Now he says... What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Anybody hear that? Fitted to means what? Prepared for, or built for. You know, a man's got a lump of clay. Can he make clay pigeons out of it? What are those clay pigeons fitted for? Shoot, shoot with a shotgun. But they serve a purpose, don't they? And a lot of people, we're fitted for that, right? Yeah, we are. From day one. Hey, look, a lost person that dies and goes to hell is fitted for destruction. Now, I'm not telling y'all that God created man and made man go to hell. Who chose sin? Adam. Folks, you can't lay any wrongdoing at God's feet, can you? Has God ever once caused someone to sin? The Bible says He can't do that. But will God use sin to serve His purposes? Folks, God will use sin to teach me and you. He don't make us sin. It's kind of like, a, I've told y'all the story before. I had an uncle that more or less raised me as a teenager, but I was working on a car and I had to uh, ratchet like this right in front of the radiator trying to break loose the water pump. And my uncle said, son, turn that around. I said, I got this. He said, oh, pardon me. And he sat down with his coffee mug and sat there until the ratchet slipped and I punched the radiator. Them fins just sliced my knuckles up. You know what my uncle did? He stood up and giggled and walked off. I have never until this day done that again. See, he used my own ignorance to teach me a lesson, didn't he? <laughs> we all know John Wayne, Honda. Same. Son, don't touch that dog. Yeah, right. He's not the kind. Son, I told you twice, but a man ought to do whatever he wants. And what happens next? Bitch, bitch. He got bit. And the woman had a fit. And John Wayne said, what are you mad about? The youngster just learned a lesson. See, that's the kind of way God uses sin. He don't make a sin. But now he says, verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. You know, you can come up with so many reasons to fight against election and sovereignty here, but you can't come up with any reasonable ones. If you just leave it what it said, what did it say God did with some vessels? Fitted for destruction. What's it say with these others? Afore prepared unto glory. Afore prepared when? Before the foundation of the world. They were afore prepared unto glory. Even us. Now Paul's talking to the Romans, isn't he? There are those who would say he's only talking to the Jews in Rome, the believers. But watch what he says next. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. 
then does this refer to Gentile believers? Yeah. Yes. yes. Next verse. As he saith also in Osi or Hosea. Then is what he about to quote refer to saved Gentiles? Yes. I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved. So then when he talks about Hosea and a people that were not his people being made his people, is he talking about the Jewish nation? No. What's he talking about? Gentile. He's talking about the church, the body of Christ. And in Christ, is there Jew and Gentile? No. Bond or free? No. Male or female? Folks, what is there in Christ? All one. All one. Now that's what Hosea is talking about. And in order to make us all one in Christ, what does that in mean? Join them to. It's union. Folks, this Bible is about a marriage. It's about how God has made it possible for sinners to be in union with Christ. Now in order for that to happen, what's got to be done? Well, lots of things have got to be removed, don't they? The first thing is the sin's got to be paid for, doesn't it? The second thing is he's got to get them out from under their own original ownership. And contrary to the way it happens in a wedding, you know, Talon's father went up there and, and willingly, with a smile, gave her over. Y'all ever seen the opposite? I hadn't, but I bet there have been some dads that just wanted to hold on to her, don't you? I mean, I imagine there have been some that just absolutely... It, you know, you can picture the idea here is that Satan is the possessor of the lost world, isn't he? And how does Jesus Christ compare him there? To a strong man. Can you just go and take a strong man's stuff? No. Hey, I'm glad to have Mr. Bailey with us here this morning. And every time I think of the strong man, I picture him. Mr. Bailey said his dad was a big guy. Mr. Bailey's a big guy. He said, no, my dad was bigger. And Mr. Bailey, correct me if I've got this wrong, but during the Depression when things got real bad, a fella come out and climbed up the pole to disconnect the power. And Mr. Bailey's dad walked out there. He said he was a man of few words, but he looked up the pole. He said, what you doing? He said, I'm about to disconnect you. He said, okay, I recommend you stay up that pole. <laughs> See? And Mr. Bailey, didn't the man come on down and leave? He, come, he didn't turn it off, but he come down and leave. <laughs> he left the power. See, he recognized something. There was a stronger man on the ground in him. Yeah, well, how in the world could one of us break the grip of the strong man, the devil? We can't. There's never been one that has escaped, has there? How do we get out of this grip? When the stronger one than him comes, it says he comes, he binds him, and then does what? Spoils his house. To spoil is to come in and to take the treasures. What's the treasure? It's the elect, and they've been hit in Adam all this time. Has Christ ever lost one? Does he know exactly where they are? Y'all watch him in the Gospels, and it's amazing if you watch the geography. Just get you a map sometime and watch how he does. He's here, there, here, there. One time he swings way out by the Mediterranean, doesn't he? He gets way out there in the land of the Gentiles, and people don't like that, but that's where he was. And he gets over there, and what happens? He meets a woman. Y'all remember the woman? She said, Lord, I, I want in on this thing too. He said, no, you don't take the children's bread and give it to the dog. She said, that's right. She said, but the dogs get some of the crumbs, don't they? You see why the Lord swung over there? Why did he swing way out there? Because that woman was there. Oh, she was there. You find this all through the Scriptures, don't you? You find the Apostle Paul one night saying, you know, I think we need to go this way. And what did the Holy Spirit say? No. That way. And so Paul takes a few steps that way and says, yeah, we need to head this way. And what happens? He gets steered back that way. And in a vision, there's a man saying, come over here. And Paul goes over there. And what happens? Lots of people Lots get of people saved. Like... In fact, God said of the city Corinth, I've got a lot of people here. Don't you worry about your safety. They might threaten you and scare you, but I got a lot of people here. Paul, preach on. Well, why did you need to tell Paul that? What does the preaching of the gospel do? Oh, you sit in front of a group of people. Hey, I, I, again, I'll use the example at this wedding, and there were some people that were really upset at this wedding. You know what I preached? That we're sinners, convicted of sin. We can't save ourselves by our works. We need a Savior, don't we? Why does that offend folks? Because folks don't like to be told what they are. I didn't like to be told what I was. In my lost condition, if somebody said that to me, I'd have been mad too. In fact, I was mad when I first heard it. But the point being is that's what the Gospel does. And yet, what did he tell Paul? Fear not. Say it. You just say it, right? He, uh, 
he, one of Tim's sons come up to me afterwards and told me something that I was so glad to hear him say. He really saw what was going on there. And both of his sons are, are planning to preach. And I'm thankful for them. And Dean and uh, Chris have met them. Just wonderful young people to be around. He come up to me, he said, I want to thank you. And I said, what for? He said, I want to thank you for saying what, what you know, really uh, a lot of people don't want to say. I'm not lifting me. I'm not, folks, I didn't do nothing. In fact, I told Lexi afterwards it was a total failure. I always feel that way after preaching. But that boy recognized something. It ain't easy to tell the truth always, is it? So when Paul tells, or when God tells Paul, don't worry about it, I've got people in this city. What did he really mean? There's people there, Paul, and you've got a job to do. Now, do y'all know what Paul's job was, according to him? He said, I have espoused you. Preach the gospel. Bring them in. Okay, so then how does God the Father arrange these meetings? He uses a go-between, doesn't he? Now, there's something wonderful in this. and It's just, I don't know. Y'all flip over to 2 Corinthians 4. I can't help go to the movie The Quiet. Now look, if you're watching, I know I'm nuts, but if y'all would watch The Quiet Man, it's, great. it's a great movie. Hey, even if you don't like John Wayne, watch it for Maureen O'Hare or whatever. It's a great movie. But do y'all remember Barry Fitzgerald, the little bitty fellow, Micheline? Yeah. Micheline. Micheline O'Flynn. What was Micheline's job besides being drunk constantly. Yeah. <laughs> he was the matchmaker. Right. It, you know, there's a, a it's it, in Ireland a Gaelic. It's called the ball door. He was the ball door. We would say he's the uh, the shackle horn. I think some of them called it. His job literally was to not only arrange the meeting between the two. He met with the father first. In that case, her older brother. Then he met with the groom, didn't he? And then they finally got to walk together a little bit. Remember, he made them sit on separate sides. Yeah. And everything they did, who was watching? Oh, yeah. He arranged every date. He arranged every... He was absolutely... What he said that day was, I take the responsibility. Now what he was saying is, I am going to make sure that she remains pure, isn't it? Any problems that he saw in her, or, the, or John Wayne, what was his job to do? Correct him. Remember John Wayne dipped his hand in the holy water? To give her water and Micheline had a fit. What kind of man are you? You know, because he was Catholic, of course. But the whole point is, he was the appointed one that was going to be the, the go-between, right? Oh, so that's what Paul was for the Corinthians. It was his job, wasn't it? Now watch him say so. Let's see a car out there doing something. I don't know why I'm telling you. I'm sorry. <laughs> like she's going to do something. <laughs> All right, anyway. In 2 Corinthians 4, watch what Paul says in verse uh, 14. Knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Did Paul know that there was coming a day when he and the Corinthians would be presented? What do we call this presentation? Folks, it's the marriage day. Y'all know... It, Nathan uh, uh, got engaged to Taylor. They agreed, right? But what was the Friday night? That was the presentation. We all know what happens. What do you do at the presentation of the bride? Everybody stands up, don't they? And here she comes. So that's what the whole thing was about. The presentation of the bride. Somebody here? Yeah, somebody's out there doing something. Okay. Now, um... Y'all go over, if you would, to Colossians 1. We'll just look at a couple examples of this. Alright, in Colossians 1, he says, verse... Uh, 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Was Paul desiring to present these people perfect in Christ? Yeah. Were they perfect in their original state? Yeah. Go ahead and do whatever you need to do. All right, here's the part two. Okay. 
Do you have any leaks inside? No, I don't know. We've been out of time, so I don't think so. You want me to look or? We're no, in Bible study. We're, we're in, in Bible church. study. I'm sorry. That's all right. You do what you need to do. Okay. So, he says here that every person he wants to present perfect in Christ. Are we perfect right now? No. Then what's he going to be doing? Perfecting us. What do we call that? Sanctification. Now, how does it start? Are we perfect in Adam by birth? No. What's our problem in Adam? First, we've got a spiritual problem, don't we? We're all dead in the Spirit. Dead in sin, right? There's no eternal life in us. We can't even have communion with God. But we've also got a mental problem, don't we? What's all our thinking? It's the thinking of this world. It's what our worldly parents teach us. And bless God if you had godly parents who taught you some godly things, but otherwise our thinking is all fouled up, isn't it? But what's the last thing that presents you and I from, or prevents us from going into God's house? Our bodies. Folks, our physical body is polluted. It's sinful. Can it? Your body, is it corrupt or incorrupt? Can it go into the presence of God? Paul said flesh and blood can't do it. So then how does he begin perfecting us? Well, first, he perfects us spiritually. And how does that take place? Blink of an eye, isn't it? New life. He said, dead in trespasses and sins. And Paul said next, but God. And Paul said, the moment but God, what did the rest of Paul's life become? Time passed. So he says, but God, who is rich in mercy, what did He do? Quickened us. So we're made alive, and from that moment, what are you? Well, you're now a citizen in Christ's kingdom. Right? Right? Spiritually alive, can you ever become not a child of God? Okay, so in that moment that that takes place, what has been done away? The guilt of sin. Okay? The guilt of sin keeps you and I from being able to go into God's presence because God said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Can a righteous God change his mind? So then that guilt has got to be removed, doesn't it? Well, how do you remove guilt from guilty people? It's impossible in this world. It? You can't do it in this world. But did God do it? God sent His Son to stand in our place and to not only take our sins upon Him, but to take the guilt upon Him. That's how we who are guilty can be declared not guilty. Because our sacrifice is so supreme. It is so special. The Lord Jesus Christ is so perfect and so holy in His Father's eyes that He can even wash away the guilt of sin. And that's the first thing that takes place. The guilt is gone, isn't it? And we have a new position in Christ. In Christ. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. We have been espoused. We have been betrothed. We have been joined to Christ, haven't we? What are we no longer? Joined to Adam. Folks, we're no longer joined to Adam. We no longer must suffer because of Adam's sin, must we? But where are we physically? Still in Adam. Right? Where will we be over here before we die? Still in Adam. When will that change? When we're separated from Adam. We'll be physically put in Christ. But what about our minds? You're saved here. We're going to be saved over here from the very presence of sin. Look, when we're separated from this body, will we ever have to fo- uh, worry again about the presence of sin? No. So that will be taken care of when we're separated, won't it? But what has to take place in between? We have to renew our minds. We have to be renewing our minds daily, don't we? And how do we do that? Through the Word. Through the Word. Okay, and this is the purification of the bride. She's chosen. When the day comes, she's picked. And she begins to be shown why it is she can be joined unto Christ. Why? Because that took care of all the problems. Sins are paid. All your past debts are paid. Every barrier preventing you from coming into God's house has been taken care of. Now, let's begin preparing you. Y'all remember my fair lady? Remember what that guy's job was? He took that girl and was going to turn her into a lady, didn't he? Well, what is sanctification? Folks, it's the changing of our thinking in order that we can be eternally with God. How long does sanctification go on? As long as you're breathing, it's going on. Okay. Now, to, to look at an example of this, go over to uh, Ephesians 5.
In Ephesians 5, uh, verse 24, I tell, let's read 21 for James. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Right? It says Paul's explanation of the marriage union, isn't it? And it says, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, when does a wife not submit herself to her husband? When her husband is going contrary to... When her husband commands her something contrary to God's will, whose will comes first? God's. So see, all these things that men assume about this and we joke about, the wife's got to submit. The man forgets she's got to submit to her godly husband, doesn't she? So he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now I want you all to think about the church as a nation. Paul said, it, or uh, Peter said it was a race, didn't he? A holy nation. Okay? Who's the head of this entire population? No? Adam. Adam is the federal head, and from him the whole thing sprung, didn't it? All that seed came from Adam. Did it not? Well, what does that make Christ? Christ is the seed. He's the promised seed, isn't He? Yeah. And what springs from Him? All the church. But we're not physically produced by Christ. We're spiritual children born of the Spirit, aren't we? By means of the Word. The Word is the process. Now He says here, verse 25, uh, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. That's my favorite verse. You know, Mr. Bailey, every time I read it, I tell them that. I tell them how Mr. Bailey told me he read that one day and just realized that's a command and that's what I'm going to do. And folks, that isn't a suggestion. It doesn't say husbands ought to love their wives. It says husbands, love your wives. Love them how much? As much as they're, they're lovable? Oh, how much? Enough to die. Enough to die for them. How much did Christ love the church? Enough to die. Enough to leave glory and die. You know why? His own body. He says next, that, why did He do this? In order that He might sanctify, set apart, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. Y'all picture it. The Father picked the bride, didn't He? The bride is in filth and ill repute. The Son comes and begins cleansing the bride. First, He must take her out from under the bondage. He must pay the debt that's owed. He must satisfy the law because the law had a righteous, a proper demand on man. The law says one sin and what happens? The yeah. death. So Christ had to meet all of those things before the Father could allow a new marriage because otherwise it would have been against God's own law, wouldn't it? If a man's joined unto two wives, what is he? He's an adulterer. Alright, so basically what we've got here, Christ came into the world and through His life of law keeping, through His righteousness and His sacrifice on the cross, and through His resurrection, He's now seated at the right hand of the Father and becomes the head of this new race, doesn't he? And this new race is an amazing thing because every one of them together, like threads sewn together, are espoused or joined into one church, aren't they? This is the people of God. What's the church going to be for Christ? His inheritance. This is who, folks, this is what's going to populate the new earth, the new people. So he goes on here and says again, look at verse 27 one more time that He might present it to Himself a glorious church. Now, is Christ going to present Himself a filthy church? No. Then what is He going to do with it? Amen. Wash it. Perfect it. Perfect it. And is that something that happens in a day? No. No. So then what's the means that He's given us to do this? The Word. The washing of the water by the Word. Now, who is the one that Christ has appointed? Like we, I talked about little Nicolino Flynn. Hit that the brother said, "Okay, you accept responsibility." And from that point forward, who took the reins? Michelin. Yeah. Who has Christ committed unto the church to perform this work? The Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. It's the same picture back here. Whenever the father Abraham picked a bride for his son Isaac, who had just been resurrected from the dead in a figure, hadn't he? And the very next thing we read is that he sends his servant to get him a bride. Where did He tell him to get a bride? From His own people. 
And down went the servant. His name's never mentioned. And the servant took with him gifts, didn't he? He went down there and he picked out a bride and he brought her home and Isaac met her when she came home. Yeah, that's the whole story of the Bible. This is the story about how Christ came down here and took care of everything that needed to be taken care of through His death, His burial, and His resurrection like we had in Genesis 22 when Isaac went up the mountain with Abraham. In resurrection, He sits down and what does He do? He sends forth the Spirit. Y'all remember the night He went over the wedding vows over and over in John 14, 15, 16, and 17. What did He keep telling them? Don't fret. I'm going to prepare a place and I'm going to send you the Comforter. And who's the Comforter? He's that little Michelino Flynn character, only it's, the, it's God Almighty. But He is the go-between. He's the one that's preparing them for the marriage, isn't He? Does the Son need any preparation? Who needs all the preparation? The bride. And what does the Spirit give us? The Word of God. Now this is how He does it, and this is how it works, and this is exactly what's going on today. In a minute, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we're going to read a story from Esther. Because we've got that same character in the book of Esther. And if y'all remember, uh, in, in Esther it'll be the case, and in all the old cultures, when the, when the princess was had someone appointed to care for her, it was a man. What did they do to that man? Right. They made him a eunuch. Why did they make that man a eunuch? So his thinking would be different about that young girl. What was his thinking? Was there anything he wanted from that young girl? What did he care about? Satisfying his king, the master. That's all he cared about. What did the Holy Spirit do? He was sent into this world not wanting something from me and you come only to testify and to glorify Christ, didn't he? Does the Holy Spirit in any way want to get something from us? No, folks, He's playing the position of a servant and of all. Of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look how even the Holy Spirit subjected Himself unto submission. He wants to get us. He wants to bring us in there perfect. And that's the process. Alright, let's take a break then we'll pick it up again.